it's not the best use of your time, but you would you still need to get it taken care of. Okay, so let me get my slide deck pulled up just real quick. One moment. Okay, let me share my screen real quick, sorry. Maybe my computer's not moving very slow. Awesome, okay. So uh, I'm gonna try to keep my eye on the chat. So if anybody has any questions or if I'm going too fast, please let me know. This is a topic I talk about all the time. So if I start going too fast, if I use jargon or technical terms that you're not familiar with, please put it in the chat because I wanna make sure that all the questions get answered. Uh, that's why we're here, okay? So prospecting, lead gen and outreach, right? Uh, there's a lot that gets misconstrued here. So. Let's dive in and let's talk about it. Okay, so let me, can I, can you also see, see my screen? Yeah. Perfect, just wanna make sure I, I turned on presentation mode and sometimes it kicks it out. Okay, so there's, in the way that we talk about it with our clients, there's two main categories when we're thinking about this. There's direct outreach, prospecting and lead gen, and then there's indirect prospecting, outreach and lead gen. We kind of put all three of them together because the goal is to bring in new opportunities, right? Some people call those leads, some people call those prospects, you know, it, it's largely interchangeable, but for our clients and for our use, we kind of dump them into kind of two main categories. There's direct and there's indirect, okay? And so for direct outreach, we, we think of these as being the proactive actions that you completely own, okay? So some of this is gonna be stuff that might not be uh, things that you need to do for your business, but these are very common proactive things that people use in direct outreach and prospecting, right? So the first one is canvassing, right? Those guys who were selling solar and they're out there knocking on doors, that's canvassing, right? So they're very direct. Uh, it might look like cold calling, the bane of most people's existence, right? Totally fine. It might be cold email, sending lots of emails to people, it might be cold direct messages, right? If you're on LinkedIn, if you're on social media and you're putting yourself out there as a freelancer or a business owner or a consultant, you're probably getting messages from people who were trying to pitch you, okay? It is still a direct um, piece of outreach in our opinion because of the ability to control the volume. And then we also lump direct mail in here because direct mail, you can get very granular in your targeting of like who you're trying to ship pieces out to and stuff. And so when we can have a targeting element, we think about it as being more direct, right? Because as opposed to just going for uh, trying to hit everybody, you can have some specificity. And specificity is really the thing that gets you past that kind of front door, this person just wants to sell me kind of thing. But with direct outreach, you always control the volume. You can determine the baselines, right? So you can always own these things completely. And that also makes it easier to delegate and outsource to others. But targeting is going to have a huge impact in all your outreach, all of your prospecting, all of your lead gen. Targeting is always going to be a massive lever. And lots of people don't really pay enough attention to this, in our opinion. We're going to talk a little bit more about that as we go on. The other side of that is we have indirect prospecting and lead gen. These are still activities that we consider being proactive, but we have less control here than we do with the direct. Okay, so we might need more volume to establish the baseline and to really feel comfortable using these as our main like lead generation sources, right? So a couple of different examples, networking, right? You can control the amount of networking meetings you ask for. And if you're going for referrals on those networking calls, you can even ask for the referral. You can control those two things, but sometimes it can be a struggle to get the person to actually follow up, do the introduction and to get that actual momentum going off of that referral introduction. So you, we lose a little bit of control there. Um, also podcasting, public speaking, trade shows. These can be huge levers, right? They can bring in lots of leads, but there's lots of elements that we don't control, right? When does the, when does the episode come out? Is this episode dialed to an audience that's very similar to the audience that I serve? So they can be great. They're normal. Both of these things are part of our plans for most of our clients, but they're not the main plan because of the indirect nature of it, you can't ever really own the outcome, okay? And that's what we're talking about on this kind of thing, right? When you can own this, you can have clarity into the volume of effort, right? 
How many dials does it take you to get to a conversation? How many conversations does it take you to get to a meeting? Once you know this math problem, right, and you have a big enough sample size, you can kind of lean into it as a math problem, right? You can just kind of do the math and we have a little bit of math in here. The response rate. This is super important to be tracking because it, it's gonna tell you how good your targeting is. If you're not speaking the language of the people that you think that you're trying to help, if you don't speak that language the right way, there's always gonna be this kind of walled up response from people. Whereas if you can speak their language, they're gonna treat you like someone who understands what they're doing and it's gonna feel less like a sales conversation and more of just like a partner conversation or two people who know what they're talking about sitting down to have a great conversation. Quality rate. This is really, really important because if you were generating your own leads or if you're having someone else generate leads for you, are they qualified for the service or offer or solution? And I have in parentheses here to check against the avatar. The avatar is something that lots of people do when they're working with a marketing company or if they have an internal marketing team. And an avatar is essentially the silhouette of the people that you serve the most. So most people tell me as a sales coach, John, I don't actually need a sales coach. I need more of the right kinds of people, the right kinds of leads. Because when I'm talking to the right kinds of people, I just close the deals, right? The minute we start talking about, okay, can you define a little bit about what that ideal person looks like? A lot of people don't have the clarity. And if you don't have that clarity, it's going to be very hard to outsource your prospecting or lead gen to anybody else, because it's always going to feel, does it feel like the right kind of client? If you can go through a process of creating an avatar or in sales, this is also called your, your ideal client profile, then you can look at it and say, hey, are these people fitting in this box that we think that we help the most? If not, what do we need to adjust? But the quality rate is a huge thing around that. Not every campaign is gonna close 20%, right? Um, lots of people think that it will, but unfortunately it doesn't always work that way. And sample size really, really matters here. So. You can always check back against the avatar if you've gone through this situation. Are they qualified to buy? Do they have the right head count? Are they at the right revenue levels, right? You can kind of create these buckets for people so that way you can be consistent in the outreach and the prospecting. Client lifetime value. This is a huge one. And what happens is lots of people in the lead gen space are selling kind of it as a commodity, right? You're gonna get hundreds of leads. You're gonna get X number of conversations within this, this amount of time. And what happens is when it gets sold to people, they're not always looking at how much can I afford to spend to acquire a customer, right? And with, some, with lots of people doing things like ads, right? Ads make a very clear math problem for how much you can afford to spend. But if you're doing more manual outreach, most people don't necessarily have that same kind of clear math problem, but knowing what a client brings in, what they do for the business for you, what they bring in in the, in the form of revenue and how long they stay, you're gonna have a much better grasp on what you can afford to spend to acquire a lead, okay? So some examples here, just that way we can kind of see some math on paper here. If you're cold calling, you might be able to get 10 dials and get five chats with three appointments and two of these might, might actually be qualified to, to fit. This is a loose number, but this is just to kind of show you there's always going to be a drop off in the lead gen prospecting outreach process. It's always gonna be a high volume because you're not trying to bring everybody in. You're trying to bring in the right people. And I think that most people miss this. So you should be looking to disqualify people who don't fit as opposed to trying to make everybody fit in the box. This will provide a lot of uh, competence and confidence in the people that you're talking to because no one wants to be on the receiving end of a pitch that is being paraded in front of everybody on the planet. If we're doing direct messages, you might need to send 25 direct messages to get 15 chats, to get five appointments and two might be qualified. But if this is your run rate over a big enough sample size, you can begin to kind of count on it a little bit, right? And when you do this for a while, you'll start to create a bit of a pulse, right? You'll feel it when you're looking at your calendar, when you're looking at your meetings, when you're looking at these things and it kind of becomes part of you. It just becomes this thing that like, you're just very attuned to if you're, if you're focused on it. With a podcast appearance, you might get lots of new followers, new people who are like going to the site to download maybe something, but they might not be qualified. And once again, we might not have that granularity because you know it's a podcast and we might not have the clarity of who that audience is. So while it's great, it's great for branding your bill or building your brand, getting your name out there. 
it's not always going to be the cleanest way of generating leads in conversations. So which one do we do? Do we do the direct? Do we do the indirect? Okay. Building your business completely on the indirect acquisition means you can't ever really own the outcome, right? When I was running my website design agency with my business partner, we were in the affordable niche. And so what that allowed us to do was to spend a lot of time networking, connecting with other agencies who were charging a lot more than we were. And so we had a huge network of agencies who were going to send us business if it was a good fit for us. The bad part about that is sometimes people forget about the referral partners. Maybe they're too busy in their own pipeline and maybe they just forget to send somebody over to, to make that kind of connection request and that handoff. So if you're always in that around the turn, right? Or that, that indirect, right? Because they have to pass it to you. You give up a level of control there and it makes it very difficult to say, we're gonna hit X number of sales within this timeline. And lots of organizations are counting on the revenue that sales brings in to pay for other initiatives, product improvement, you know, if you're freelancing, paying your bills, things like that. So we think that you should do a little bit of both, okay? What you're going to feel comfortable with is going to come down to your personality a little bit. On, on the last webinar, we talked a little bit about personality. Um, it's one of my favorite things to talk about because certain people are going to hate certain things. Most people hate cold calling, but I know some people who are machines at it. They don't let it stop them. They get in there and they just treat it as just an activity. They're not putting their like emotions into it. It allows them to get a lot done. The ones that you will do regularly and consistently are better than the ones that have a higher outcome that you're not going to do regularly or consistently because they're uncomfortable. You don't feel comfortable. You might feel like you're interrupting these people. All these things are tied to our personality and, and our view of the world. So you might be stuck trying to do things that are not really going to serve you the fastest, but they're going to feel more comfortable. So leaning into why some of this stuff feels like more of a struggle than others is super important. Most people tend to like the indirect manners because they don't want to feel salesy, but there's always ways of having a direct conversation without being salesy. And that's really what we work on with our clients and the people that we coach. Indirect plays have huge authority, right? Um, I, I wrote a book last year and part of that process was to build more authority, right? To use the book as a lead generator, right? And so some people will go buy the book off of Amazon and that's awesome. Some people will listen to the audio book and then reach out to me. That's also all okay. I'm also okay sending the book manually out to every prospect that I think I could have a really great conversation with and potentially help. So I can use it in different ways, but it's not always a one-to-one -one thing. Right? I can pick up the phone and I can call someone if I can get a hold of them and have a conversation. I can open my LinkedIn. I can send a DM to someone and have a great conversation and see if there's a fit there. I could send lots of books and might not get a conversation from them. Right, So have to be aware. But when you can do a little bit of both, you're going to be better than most people. Right, Because most people avoid the prospecting and outreach stuff for themselves. And it puts them in sometimes in some very bad positions when it comes to like their cash flow and their business growth. This is essentially what I just said. I got a little ahead of myself. I apologize. But the there's a a, a guy who I follow is a workout guy, and and the thing that he says is is the plan that you will follow is better than the perfect one that you can't follow, right? And that goes for dieting or working out or your business plan or your prospecting and outreach. I don't love to cold call. It's not my favorite outreach method. I can do it. I've done lots of it, but my preferred way is to send DMs on LinkedIn and on Facebook and on the platforms where I have a bit of an audience to kind of qualify, start conversations and then move it to a call. It's just my preferred way, but I'm very consistent at it. I do on average five to 10 new connections each day. And so my network is always growing. I always have new conversations coming in. So because I can do it very consistently, that's the one that I choose to do, right? I'm going to pause for a second. Anybody have any questions so far before I go into the next thing? Do we have anything in the chat or anything? I don't see anything. Okay, we're going to keep going. Sample size and consistency are super, super crucial. Oh, wait, sorry. I have a question. Yeah, please. Um, I was wondering about how do you, like, how do you, like, with DMs and stuff, sometimes mm -hmm. they sound kind of like, it's like a robot. Like, how mm -hmm. do you 
like, I don't know, I guess this is like a, like, how do you like format it in a way where it's like sounds personal, but also doesn't sound like it's like a scam? I don't know if that makes any sense, but yeah. Good question. Very good question. And some of this comes down to your own personal preference, right? Uh, some people, they just want to get the pitch out of the way, right? And so you'll, if, if you've been on LinkedIn for any length of time, you've been pitched by somebody, right? And sometimes it's these huge copy and paste, you know, manifestos of here's who we help and everything. And Personally, I don't like that. I like having a relationship with the people that I'm going to buy from and work with. There are some people who just want to be pitched so that way they can look at it and make a decision and move on, right? So you're never going to please everybody. What I tell everybody is do the things that make you feel comfortable at the end of the day, right? Because the whole point of bearing the risk of going out as a freelancer and trying to develop something is having more control over the actions and also being able to do it the way that you want to do it. Right. So if you like to chat a little bit, like, hey, what are you working on? And then kind of move into like, hey, is there room for us to work together? That's totally okay. Some people really like the, you know, uh, hey, we help this person do this within this kind of time frame. Is that something that you would be interested in talking about? You're going to get a lot of no's by being more direct because people are moving very, very quickly. Right. Think about all the notifications that we're getting from all these different platforms everything wants our attention. So when you make it super easy for them to say, oh, I don't need that, you're going to get a lot of no's. That's not necessarily a bad thing, right? You'll be able to do more volume, but you're not going to necessarily get the depth that you might need, especially if you're newer. Does that help? Yeah, thank you so much. You're more than welcome, more than welcome. So um, the best salespeople on the planet, the highest performers are always prospecting and not always closing, right? I know a lot of people have seen the, seen the movie and, you know, are very familiar with, you know, Alec Baldwin and this, this, the set of steak knives and everything, but you should always be looking for new people to connect with and talk to because they might have overlap. They might be a prospect for you, but when you shut it down, because, you know, if it's not something you love to do it's very easy to avoid and say, you know what, I'm good for now, right? The pipeline looks good. I've got lots of clients. Cash flow is great. And so then you kind of take your foot off of it a little bit, right? And so you're just kind of taking your foot off the gas and you're not going to notice a gap that day. You're going to notice a gap weeks, months later. And it's kind of hard to attribute to the fact that we kind of took our foot off of the gas and the eye off the goal of keeping a certain number of meetings and a certain number of new people coming into our network and into our circle and it just feels like, why is this happening to me, right? So we can always kind of look back at whenever you're having a dry spell at what that's attributed to. And it's usually due to being either so busy that prospecting has to take a backseat or a feeling of getting a little bit comfortable and wanting to put it in the backseat, okay? Prospecting, my coach said this to me for forever, is that it's a compounded interest, right? Especially if you're going for the networking play, because if you're networking with people, you're not really trying to sell to them. You're trying to figure out if they know people who need you. And so if you can get on average one to two new connections for every person you meet, that adds up rather quickly, right? But you have to do it the right way and you have to be consistent about it or else you can't count on it. Okay. And the, the last one is just something I tell everybody. There's never really a great reason to not be networking, right? Even if you're full, why not have a meeting with someone who might need your help or might, or might have clients who need your help, right? These can be very easy, light level conversations. They can also be great for building your community, for keeping you on pace, right? Because sometimes it can be very lonely as a freelancer, right? If you're just working on your own and working on client work. So having meetings is, is great for community and also just keeping the, the locomotive moving in the right direction. Outsourcing and delegating. This is everybody's kind of favorite topic when, when they're looking at this stuff, right? Because everybody would like to have the leads coming in and they just step in at a later stage in the process to where they get to educate, provide value, see if there's opportunity to work together and then close the deal. The hard part about outsourcing and delegating is that when the freelancer is doing it, when the company owner or the founder is doing it, it's, it's just their time. So lots of people aren't very accountable with their time. But the minute you go to outsource it and delegate it, you're no longer using your time, you're using your funds to do so. And so what that always does is it provides a little bit of pressure on the situation to get a certain amount of things done. So going back to that um, client lifetime value, knowing how much you can afford to spend to generate a lead, to generate an opportunity, and also knowing the math around how many on average opportunities you need to get to the deal 
then you can start to look at how much you can afford to pay someone else to handle this for you. And this stuff ranges anywhere down from, you know, we have a partner that we work with a lot who's $450 a month. I also have another partner on the other end of this, on the other end of the um, range, they're $4,000 per month. They both work, but they work for different kinds of clients at different kinds of levels with different kinds of price points. So knowing what you can afford is really important here. Too many people buy lead gen thinking kind of like, everything is going to be okay. I'm going to close a certain number of these deals and I'm going to be able to pay for this in the, in the ongoing thing. Doing it the right way means that you have the clarity of who you are serving, right? And so going back to that, to that avatar exercise, who do you say yes to? Who do you say no to? But being able to provide that clarity to the people that you're working with, if you're going to outsource this and delegate this is super crucial because you don't want them sending you every opportunity that they can get on the call or, or who will respond to an email. You want people who are going to be very well qualified. Um, so doing some of this on your, on your own initially is really, really important to getting good results from hiring someone else to do it. Patience is a huge thing, right? Um, most lead gen things take a little bit of kind of dialing and iterating to really kind of make sure that you're talking to the right audience with the right tempo, with the right kind of urgency and the marketing that you're doing before, right? The DM, the cold email, the cold call is all going to set the pace for what happens in the, in that first conversation. So if you get very pitchy, right, which is very common when you're, whenever you're hiring lead gen people, they go very, very pitchy. If that provides a whole lot of um, pressure and friction for the sales call and you like a more consultative approach, it might always feel a little bit weird. Like you're like kind of trying to talk to people who aren't really lined up for you, okay? Expectations, this is my, this is my favorite topic. A lot of people are used to selling to word of mouth referrals because that's how they that, that's how they've grown their business right and so a word of mouth referral conversation is a little bit different than a conversation with cold traffic right with cold traffic you have to do a lot more to build trust and rapport you have to pull them into the conversation very collaboratively you have to dive deeper into their pains and their problems and their needs to change with a word of mouth they already know like and trust you because you came in as a referral from someone else so if you're selling half the time to warm traffic, word of mouth traffic, and then you have someone over here who's generating colder conversations for you, you have to run those conversations a little bit differently. So that way you can actually have some information to pass back to them about how you could potentially change it, iterate it to get better results. So you have to be a guide in less of, okay, well, let's just go ahead and get started, right? So that asking really great questions, taking some time to build a little bit of rapport, asking questions so that way they can, they can inform the picture. So that way, if you do think that there's room to work together, they know that you've listened. They know that you're giving them something that makes sense for them, as opposed to just like a one size fits all kind of situation. Pause for a second. Is it, anybody have any questions before I go on to the next slide? Okay. Awesome. This is the last slide. So lead generation comes in all kinds of different formats. Um, Dylan, who's, who's on this call, actually does lead gen for people, right? He's a sales rep for, for a lead gen company and he's a client of mine. So he, thank you for coming to support Dylan. I appreciate it. But it comes in all different shapes and sizes, right? I know people who hire people in the Philippines for $3 an hour to cold call and do cold outreach for them. I think that that is you know, uh, probably not super ideal for the long term. But then again, on the other side of it, not everybody can afford $4,000 a month for, you know, eight to 10 meetings on average, right? So it's about finding the sweet spot. And then also someone that you can trust, right? Because this is very much a back and forth. How did this go? Well, this is what's happening on the calls. Okay, great. How do we adjust that? If it's a black or white kind of situation, it's typically because you it was sold as this is, going to be the, the game changer you need. And often it's not, right? Lead gen has got a terrible name in lots of circles because lots of people have tried it and never gotten the deal off of it. And that kind of stuff spreads like wildfire in any kind of industry, right? So 
you really want to kind of do some math, figure out what kind of makes sense, what you can allow to run for a little bit if you're going to outsource it and delegate it. Once again, hopefully you've done enough on your own that you feel very comfortable in the community and the people that you're trying to serve, including the people that you should say no to, right? That, that'll be helpful to you. It'll be helpful to your lead gen. And if you get to the point to where you hire on a salesperson, it's going to be super crucial to them. So we take people through a process of looking at how much they can afford to spend, what kind of like meeting cadences kind of make sense. Because most people, if they don't have good sales process, if they don't have a good CRM, if they don't have some of these kind of foundational things, if you add three more leads to their email inbox or to their spreadsheet, it's, it's overwhelming, right? So part of it is about having your process in place, the right tools and the right nets. So that way you catch everything that comes this way. Um, but we kind of audit people for that. We kind of talk about what is going to be necessary, the potential gaps. So anybody here who is, who's interested in potentially kind of taking that leap, we'd love to sit down with you and talk about it. And anybody who's here today, we actually have a guide about how to get referrals on LinkedIn from your existing connections. So the people that you're already connected with, you can reach out to them and look for opportunities to get referrals and pass uh, referrals and introductions back and forth. So if you were here and you would like it, I would love to share it with you. Please reach out to me either on the Numina app or on LinkedIn, and we'll share it with you for absolutely free. That is, that is it. And I'm two minutes over. Super sorry, Alyssa. Oh, no, no, don't worry at all, John. Um, I just have a few questions, or if anyone please. else has any questions, please feel free to interrupt me or put in the chat, whatever is easiest for anyone. Um, so when you're talking about the right fit of client, I know that's a big emphasis in your process. What characteristics or traits do you usually look for for finding someone who's the right quote unquote fit? Great question, right? Um, so when you're thinking about your avatar, there's uh, marketing teams spend hours and days, right? And, and lots of marketing teams will even go in and say, our avatar is Sally and Sally is this kind of person. They do this, they're in this kind of age range. And a lot of times they're, they're using that because they're trying to penetrate the new market, right? The way that we think about it is if you've been working with some clients, you already have some ideas in your head about what makes a client good and what makes a client bad, right? And when you can start to think about that, what makes them good? What is consistent? What do the trends say about what, what makes a good client versus a bad client? You can then start to think about great, how would I uncover this in a discovery call in a very kind of light way? For, for me personally, I'm not a hard pressure salesperson, right? So people who are looking for that, um, they're not going to have a great experience with me, right? So one of my questions is, you know, what kind of closing rate are you looking for, right? If, if someone says, Jana, I expect every lead to close. I don't think I can help you. I don't think I'm the right one to help you, right? So part of it is being proactive enough that you are you're thinking about the clients, right? The ones you love versus the ones you, you don't love or the, and the ones you wish you would fire, right? If you had the, the, the ability to do so, what, what are the commonalities? What frustrates you about them? What do you love about the other ones? And then start building questions. So that way it makes it okay for them to be themselves, right? Because if you load your questions, you're gonna get a pressurized result and they might just be telling you what they think you want to hear to kind of keep the conversation moving forward. So building the question in a way that you're not, you're not saying, hey, do you want to close every deal or do you want to be a good human? Like there's not really room for them to, to say, well, I want to close every deal, but you want them to be able to answer honestly with you. So not loading your questions, keeping it very conversational, but knowing exactly what that person looks like. And that goes back to the, the avatar exercise, really leaning into what do they want, right? Yeah. yeah. So does that help? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. That was awesome. And I think Dylan has a question. Yeah. What do you got, Dylan? No softballs. Give me a good one. <laughs> uh, so it's a bit more of a question around sort of how to phrase the, the kind of outreach in such a way that you can have like thought shaping questions mm -hmm. to qualify for the type of problem that you solve for a client. Mm -hmm. Is it too soon to do it in the direct message stage or would it be better to do it in a call? How would you approach something like that good so question like a, a qualification step before you get the call coming in good question if you are the kind of person who likes building you know lead magnets guides things like that i think you can cover more in the in in the dm right because they're they're going to be moving quickly and if you can do like a leave behind right which is the same thing as a lead magnet but done on a one-to-one -one basis you can leave them something and so you can be hyper specific right so 
hey, uh, lots of people are um, using LinkedIn as a lead generation source. Are you using LinkedIn as a lead generation source? Would you like to see our guide? Right? You can be very direct there because you have something to give them and then something to follow up on. The less you have in the form of marketing collateral, the more I'm trying to keep it as a chat and, the, and moving it back and forth and then trying to move it on to a call so we can have a conversation. When you're communicating in the written word, you don't get to have control over the tone. They get to read it with whatever tone they want at whatever time they want. And that can lead to some massive issues, right? You might just be trying to ask a very direct question of, you know, is this something worth moving forward on or not? But if they've had a bad day and they come in and they read that message and they get to inject their tone, they might read it with bad sales tone. And then you don't get to move anything forward because they're just thinking that you're just trying to close them. So part of it is about what you have to like offer in the name of value in the name of help. And then also would you like, how challenging do you need to be? Right. Because for what I do, I'm trying to work with only people who want ethical consultative salespeople, right? And, and people who want to learn to sell in a way that makes them feel comfortable, right? Lots of people just want me to come in and essentially scold their team into doing the right things and being very high pressure. And that's not, it's not gonna be fun for me. It's not gonna be the thing that I'm gonna be able to do. And they're gonna hate that outcome. It would just make more sense to say no and refer them to someone else who does do those things. Is that? Good, Dylan. Awesome. We have one over here in the chat. Can you touch a bit on deciding rates and when to be flexible for certain potential leads? Sometimes I'm torn between deciding to take lower paying work that may be more consistent versus aiming for bigger paying clients who need services for only a few months. Ooh, yeah, really, really great question. Um, the way that I think about it is I think about like the long-term potential, right? If I'm dealing with somebody who, uh, let's say they wanna offer my services to their clients, right? Because we do that for some people. If you're creating um, opportunities and conversations for people and you don't have someone like me who is able to coach those people and how to have the conversations the right way, you're gonna have a lot of churn, right? So for those people, since they're going to have multiple clients who are going to potentially need me, I'm willing to discount my rates, right? If it's just like a one-off, uh, sorry, the rate is the rate, right? Unless you just see a really great opportunity or if it's someone that you really, want to help, right? I'm not a believer in the fact that you shouldn't ever discount. I'm a big believer in the fact that like when you build a package and they say that it's too expensive, you can take some of those things out of the package to reduce the scope. So that way you can reduce the pricing. And so that way you're not starting off with the idea that they can negotiate you down and just like make it about price. So does that help? Does that answer the question, Amita? So we'll wait on that. Anybody else have any questions? Um, yeah, I just have a couple of quick questions. So sure. if someone doesn't initially respond, how long do you wait to send a follow-up and how many follow-ups is you know appropriate to send? <laughs> so uh, you're gonna get a lot of different answers on this. Um, yeah. And some people are going to take a much more marketing approach, right? And, the, and if you're talking to a marketer who is trying to teach you how to sell, they're going to tell you that you need 17 to 18 touches, right? To kind of get something going. I don't believe that that's true. I think that that is something that can work if you have like, like an email newsletter or some sort of long-term nurturing kind of funnel or process, then it's super easy to have lots of conversations and dump them into that process. And then if, if the content is good and it's relevant, it's just a matter of time before they start seeing it your way. If you are not the person that has that, you need to make sure that you can get to clarity kind of quickly. Mm -hmm. Not everybody's going to respond and that's totally okay because honestly, you don't want everybody to respond, right? The way that we talk about it with our clients is that since there's not one offer, there's not one piece of outreach, there's not one direct mail piece or piece of swag that is going to get 100% of the people to respond, you want to use it to create friction to keep out the wrong people right? A guy who I follow recently, he, he did a giveaway on his, on his YouTube channel for a MacBook. And it was crazy because there were so many people who showed up on the day of that giveaway because they wanted a MacBook. But the next week, most of those people left because the thing that he was giving away wasn't really specific enough to his audience and his avatar. So they were just there for the MacBook. But if he had given away, you know, seven hours of consulting in small business or something else like that, he would get a much more targeted um, response from that. So meaningful friction 
is really the key in outreach and prospecting, right? So whenever I, I'm doing this and it's more like one to one. I try to very, I try to keep it very conversational. I talk about the buckets of people that I help and what they're feeling before they work with me and stuff. If I'm doing, if I'm doing a DM, I'm trying to have a chat. I'm not trying to pitch as much as like, hey, I. Sometimes it's just, how's it going? Happy to be connected. What's going on in your world? So that way we can have a bit of a chat in a very light-handed way, and then I can figure out if there's opportunities there because there's not always going to be. So. When you're doing a really good job, you're listening for the little things. You're looking for the little things that indicate maybe they're not ready, right? Um, we can have a conversation, but we're pretty happy with the person we already have. Okay, mm-hmm. great. What do you want to chat about? Right? Like that, that's really the question we, we need to ask in that moment, because why would you take a meeting with a salesperson if you're already happy with the current solution? Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Okay. So, so some of this is challenging what's comfortable, right? Because whenever I started... And getting to these like qualifying questions, it was uncomfortable for me. I'm an introvert, right? I'm a C personality type. I'm much more of an engineer than I am the actual like cut from the same cloth salesperson. So I didn't like challenging people. I didn't really like kind of asking heavy questions and I would avoid them. And when you avoid them, it just stretches out your selling cycle. It makes it very, very difficult to forecast and to plan and also understand what's working. Because if you spend enough time with anybody, eventually they're going to come around to your way of thinking. Eventually they'll find something that they can buy from you to try it out. But if you're freelancing, you don't have for, for, for forever to spend with each individual person that you make a connection with. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see, Ernest, do you measure through your direct and indirect methods how many people respond and give you their email to be able to contact with them and to contact them with a nurturing campaign? If you do to get that email to give away something of value f- to get the email, if you do to get that email, to get, to give away something of value to. Oh, um, so when you have a good CRM and good CRM hygiene and a good culture around like CRM, then what happens is that should be the net. Everything that comes in gets put into like a universal inbox, right? Um, Getting Things Done is a great book about productivity. And one of the things he talks about is having a universal inbox. So that way you're not trying to hold things in your head. A good CRM can provide that net. So we try to have things that will catch things in that net, right? So landing pages are a really great way to catch those people. So you can just say, hey, go to this landing page and take a look at it. So that way, whenever they sign up for more information, you kind of have them in your marketing circle. That requires the foresight to go in and put in the landing page work and effort and include all that in, right? Um, being really honest, the reason why we're giving away the, the guide for the endless referrals is the fact that some people are going to want a little bit more help after working their way through that guide, right? And then, th- then the conversation would make sense. So I'm not pushing people to a landing page in this situation. I'm, I'm asking if you would like it, would be happy to share, share it with you. And so that's kind of my way of kind of building that net. So uh, you, you definitely want to track and measure because baseline is everything because there's too many salespeople who are just kind of winging it. They're just kind of in a, in a mad scramble of trying to figure it out. And that's not ever helpful because when you're in that scramble, you can't be strategic. And when you're in that scramble, you're also probably in a very emotional state and it's going to feel like you need to win every one of those deals. And that gets communicated in the sales conversation. Does that help Ernest? If the most part, I I think on the direct, you have a, you know, you have a contact for them, either an email or Mm -hmm. LinkedIn address. If you're posting something, what I heard Elisa and others talk about, um, you're basically putting out some information and people respond to that and say, John, I'd like to learn more about that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, either on your landing page or direct communication, you'd say, well, give me your contact information. Yes. in a lot of these campaigns, you know, that there's a big reluctance to do that, right? Sometimes you see these, you know, as I forget, and Jaylee or whoever it was that said, you know, it, it feels like it's um, a con job, you know, before they even say a word to you, you know, they want all your contact information, your firstborn, yeah. et cetera. And, <laughs> and, 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 you know, to be fair to them, that, that there's an equal exchange of value you know, when yeah. they call up. And, and I think that's what I heard you say that you do. Um, so on the indirect side, if you're trying to capture these emails and then, you know, not everybody's going to buy tomorrow, you know. Exactly. I may mm-hmm. listen to your thing and need your sales services a year from now. 
Yeah. But, you know, as long as you're in front of me once a month or whatever, and I get some kind of update from John, then, you know, when I really do need that sales service, I can call you back, you know, yeah. now warm lead instead of a cold lead, right? So exactly. that's kind of where I was headed with that, John. Thanks. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who get a lot of leads off of posting off of social, right? But once again, that I view that as an indirect thing because algorithms are going to change. What what algorithms like like currently LinkedIn? If you put up a poll, they're going to show that to lots of people because it's very easy to engage. And since they need to keep people on their platform, it it behooves them to show highly engaging content. But it, as those algorithms shift and everything, it, it, you might not be able to count on it. It might not become quite as clean. The interesting thing is, I don't think if you're doing a DM strategy that you need to go super far down the path of trying to collect it, collect all the information because it's in a DM. You're, you're already connected to them, right? You can go back to the people that you've had conversations with and you've shared, you know, uh, some, some valuable content and go back to those people directly and say, Hey, how was this? Did it help you? Yeah. The DM part, I get it's, it's just the vast unknown that you're trying to bring into your community, you know, Mm -hmm. so that, that was more where the target of my question was. And, and yeah. how you reward them for joining your community. You know, it, it's going to be very, very different depending upon the market, right? The things that I should be talking about because they're going to be valuable to the people that I'm trying to serve are not going to be essentially the same things that other people who were sales coaches, right? Because that specificity is really the most important part. And that goes back to the avatar and really spending time talking to the people that you're serving. Why do you buy from me? What do you really like? What, what would it look like if I charged you more? Would you stay or would you go? What would it mean or need to look like for you to want to stay if we, if we increased our rates and did these kinds of things? Like these kinds of conversations are so important for building this out and your best clients will share it with you, right? That's really important. You, you can't think about this as like, I don't want to bother these people. Like this is what's going to propel your business forward and your best clients, the ones that you should be building your avatar off of, can't wait to share it with you. Good job. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Going once, going twice. Sold. Okay. So thank you guys for coming out. I appreciate it a lot. If you guys would like the guide, please send me a message. I am John Small Mountain pretty much everywhere uh, on Numina app. I'm on LinkedIn as John Small Mountain. You can find me either one of those things. Send me a DM. I will send you the guide. would be happy to share it with you. And then if you get stuck with it, please let me know. It, there is, you kind of have to, it, it's going to suck before it gets good. And, and this is just part of getting used to it. But remember, it, nothing's 100%. So, so since nothing is ever 100%, try to make it meaningful for you, right? So that way you're bringing in people who are going to be uniquely qualified to have a really great experience with you, as opposed to trying to get everybody. Awesome. On behalf of Numina, thank you for everyone who has attended. And especially thank you to John. This was super informative. And I think everyone here really learned a lot. Um, so I would like to wish everyone a great day and we will see you next month for John session. Absolutely. Thanks everybody. Thank you everyone. Bye.